Okay, so briefly, I'll try to hit the highlights of Doppler echo for you all. Um, so we're talking about some of the basic principles of cardiac ultrasound and Doppler shift. Sounds really boring, but for surgeons, it's incredibly important to understand the basics of this and demonstrate a few applications. All right, so basically the, uh, the one slide, the absolute basics on echo, uh, this is a transthoracic echo. You acquire these images from multiple different imaging angles, super important. So sort of the working horse angles are from the apex here. You think of the, uh, the probe we put it on, it's like a 2D kind of knife. We just see a 2D plane angled from that image. So one from the apex, one from subcostal. This is our, our go-to view for you know, post-op effusions and you know, that sort of concern. And then parasternal. And these are the big three sort of imaging angles. And we sort of, you can rotate a little bit, you can angulate a little bit from here, but really these, this is sort of the access to the chest that we need to see the heart and give you the views. Um, so parasternal, apical, subcostal. And we actually replicate a lot of those imaging angles on a TE, but those are sort of the basics. Um, from that, you know, uh, what the, the ultrasound sends off a whole series of beams along that slice plane and then tries to reconstruct the image based on how fast the ultrasound bounces back to the probe. So it knows how far it's going, when it hits something, and then looking at the, the change of the ultrasound frequency as it comes back, it determines the depth of what you're seeing uh, and the shape and whether something's moving or not. Okay, so this is the sort of the, the quick follow-up. This is a normal apical four-chamber view. So probes right at the apex. You're seeing one, two, three, four chambers. Uh, for those who haven't seen, the left chambers are on the right side of the image. Another example showing just easy uh, same orientation, showing prolapse of the posterior leaf of the mitral valve down here. So basically the only reason the image can make that determination is it's sent the ultrasound beam, it's waited for the return. This one is returning quite differently than this one. And then through complex sort of uh, Fournier fast transforms, it determines that there's a prolapsing leaflet here. So that's kind of the very fast uh, approach to ultrasound. So it emits these high frequency energy beams. The speed of ultrasound within the body is well defined. So that's part of the equation. It waits and then based on the depth of the image, um, so that's an important issue. So when you're doing vascular imaging and you're imaging a carotid, you're only going in two centimeters or so, you get very high frequency, high resolution imaging. If you're imaging from the apex of the heart, trying to see an, an activity at the posterior element of the atria, you might be imaging 15 centimeters. So your, your resolution will be lower and also your time dependency, your temporal resolution will be much lower. So not only does the imaging angle matter, but the depth that you're trying to image makes a big difference on the quality of the picture you get back. All right, see if I can advance this with slide. Let me advance with this guy. All right, so frequency matters, and you don't need to know a lot about frequency other than it, it really impacts, uh, depth impacts the frequency that we can use. So the idea is, if you look at the top, so you shoot out at 10 hertz, so it's very high frequency. It, the ability of a 10 hertz uh, signal to penetrate tissue is very limited. It can't go very far. So you might use 10 hertz up at the neck, go a couple of centimeters, get back, you try 10 hertz at the belly, you'll see nothing. So at the belly, you're, you're trying to go deeper, you're going down to five hertz. So you get deeper penetration with a lower frequency, but you get much less resolution. So it's always a trade-off, and that's why you see sonographers, they're fiddling with the, the knobs all the time, and they're trying to optimize the focus, the frequency, the gain. All of that makes a big difference in trying to get the, the image. So you know, when people say, well, I did, they had an echo before, why is this echo different? Some of that is gonna be operator dependent, what they did. Some of it is gonna be patient position, some of that's going to be fluid status of the patient, you know, with the, the speed of uh, ultrasound in water. Well, they're based on their hydration, that can affect things. So there's a lot of variability there. Doppler shift is the big thing that we use a lot of. Um, it's kind of hidden within the, uh, the operations of the machine, but that's the basic principle that tells you both the direction of blood flow and the velocity of blood flow. So this is truly Doppler. So the ultrasound is kind of the, the basic image creation. But Doppler is what we use to evaluate uh, all the velocities and flows across valves and within the heart. So this is the example. This is the probe. Uh, these are red blood cells moving towards the probe. So they go off. The Doppler sends off a signal at one fre frequency. And if the shift is towards the probe, then it knows that the, the target is moving towards the probe. So you get the direction and the velocity. Those are the two main outputs. And this is the opposite example, red cells going away, the frequency shift is in the other direction, it gets lower, so that the uh, probe says, okay, that's something moving away from me and it's going away at this velocity. That's the basics. Uh, this is a little pet peeve of my Christian Doppler to find all this. 
and he was a person, so he gets his last name title, uh, gets his last name capitalized forever. So when people write Doppler with a little d, that's a bad thing. He earned a big D. Um, so these are the applications. So this is a probe, blood cells moving towards it. You get this sort of a Doppler signal. So obviously when you see the signal and you, you'll come by the echo lab and you see the signal going up, that simply means it was flowing towards the probe. Signal down is away from the probe. That's your direction and velocity information. The other thing that we can get though is sort of more subtle features from a Doppler signal. And that's really about the quality of the flow. So laminar flow, something like you might see uh, in the LVOT through a, a normal, you know, sort of spiral laminar flow through a normally contracting LV. You get this nice laminar flow. It's all going the same way. And then you get this sort of uh, Doppler profile. It looks like it's drawn by a pencil. So those are, that means that the population of velocities is all very uniform. That's representing laminar flow. Contrast that to the turbulent flow you would get through uh, aortic stenosis. Uh, then you get this very dense flow where all of this is filled in. So a good Doppler quality, if you're trying to measure the stroke volume or something like that, you really want to see, and we teach our sonographers, you want to adjust things to make it look like the Doppler's been drawn by a pencil, not by a spray can. So that's about the quality of the flow you can get with Doppler. So how do we use it? Um, really measuring flow, so stroke volume, regurgitant volume, and measuring pressure. I'll show you that. So this is sort of the example, again, of uh, the basic tube with flow going through it. It could be vascular structure. Uh, we often use this sort of as an example of LVOT. So flow very basically is just cross-sectional area times velocity. That's flow. Um, so here's how we do that. This is a live case. So this is a, a three-chamber echo view. So this is LA, LV. This is left ventricular outflow tract here. And so the basic principle is stroke volume, which is centimeters cubed equals cross-sectional area, centimeters squared, times this concept of, a, of the time-velocity integral. One thing to recognize, you hear this term TVI quite a lot as you go through your careers, but really remember it measures distance. So it measures distance of blood flow. So TVI unit is centimeters. So it's very simple. It's basically centimeters times centimeters squared equals centimeters cubed. So that's the basic concept of volume determination. So to get that, we look at a Doppler, uh, we look at an echo image, we measure the diameter of the LVOT, Diameter, we assume it's circular. We know from sort of uh, all of the TAVR work and, and CTs that it's not often circular, but it's still an approximation that works most of the time. So you, you derive the, the uh, diameter, you measure the diameter, derive the area. Time velocity interval is simply a trace of the Doppler of the LVOT. So this is a sample volume put within the LVOT. Uh, it's an integration of all of these instantaneous velocities, kind of like an average, but it's you integrate all that and what you get is the distance the blood has traveled within that time period. So distance times area equals volume. So that's stroke volume. Uh, this is sort of how we use it day to day. This is the mitral annular. Again, we measure diameter. You can measure it in the four chamber, in the two chamber, different, uh, different schools of thought on that. But anyway, you derive a cross-sectional area of the mitral inflow. You measure the distance blood travels at that same point, and that gives you a mitral inflow volume. You contrast that with how much leaves the heart. So that's this continuity concept that whatever enters the ventricle has to also leave the ventricle. So you measure the blood flow in, you measure the stroke volume on the way out, and the difference is the blood that must have gone backwards. So if 120 mils enters the ventricle, only 70 mils goes out the LVOT, the 50 mils must have gone backwards. So that's your regurgitant mitral volume. When you have mixed regurgitant lesions, this gets more complicated, but for a single regurgitant lesion, this is what we call quantitative Doppler. We use it all the time to derive regurgitant volumes. So this is kind of the concept, regurgitant volume, uh, for example, for uh, AI, would be the aortic stroke volume. So what you're measuring at the LVOT, that's going out the aorta. Subtract from that the systemic. Now the systemic could either be the mitral inflow, as I just showed you, it could be the pulmonic flow, or it could be an average of the two. So what leaves the heart minus what entered the heart is the regurgitant aortic volume. Now the concepts from that, so once you've derived a regurgitant volume like that, you can come up with a regurgitant fraction. Fraction is basically, it's this uh, aortic stroke volume, again, minus the systemic. So that's basically just the regurgitant volume divided by uh, sort of the, vent, the valve you're interested in, in this case, the aortic stroke volume. The important difference, so we've got a regurgitant volume, why do you need a fraction? Your fraction is very important because it's really the volume indexed to that particular patient. So it's kind of a crude index to how much flow there should be. 
So 20 mils regurgitant volume on uh, 20 mils of regurgitant aortic uh, volume on a little old lady who's, you know, 40 kilos and, and five foot, uh, where her total stroke volume is only 50 mils. That's a lot of volume. Uh, on the other hand, that same 20 mils in a large man who's, you know, 240 pounds and six foot four, and his stroke volume is 100 cc's, is obviously a much smaller proportion. So regurgitant volume calculation is important, but the regurgitant fraction adds that element of indexing it to the volume of that particular patient. And then you can also derive effective regurgitant orifice area. It's not done very much for, it can be done for all the valves, but generally it's usually only done uh, practical purposes for the mitral valve. Uh, and that's simply taking the regurgitant volume, dividing it by the distance blood has traveled across that volume. Again, the VTI concept. So volume divided by VTI equals area. So I don't want you to know all of this, be able to do it immediately, but just sort of the general concepts when you hear them and you see them on the reports from the echo lab, that's where they come from. So this is an example of calculating area. The other important thing we do based on Doppler, uh, again, so you start with a stroke volume determination. Again, LVOT diameter, measured uh, distance of flow. And the concept is shown down here. So the stroke volume that crosses the LVOT or enters the LVOT has to be the same stroke volume that goes across the aortic valve. In this particular example, we're trying to determine the aortic valve area. So volume, it's called the continuity uh, concept. So volume on one side has to be volume on the other. Volume can be derived as just area times distance. So area times distance in the LVOT has to equal area times distance on the aortic side uh, of the valve. Um, the unknown in this case is the aortic valve area, and you just sort of rearrange the equation to derive the ABA. So cross-sectional area times LVOT VTI, which we know is the stroke volume, simply divide that by the aortic VTI, which is what you get from this Doppler trace, and that gives you the valve area. Um, so the other important thing, so that's how we get valve area. Uh, the other one is pressure. We all want to sort of estimate pressure, particularly for these uh, dysfunctional valves. This is, again, based on the, the Bernoulli equation. Uh, very complicated uh, formula that is not projecting properly, but it probably doesn't matter because there's all these complex elements of this formula that we really negate and we don't use because they're not sort of relevant in the physiologic realm. Things like flow acceleration, viscous friction, uh, convective acceleration. A lot of concepts that apply in sort of aerodynamics and physics, but not in the body. So our formula is really very simple. And this, I don't know why there's a little house here, but uh, that should be the change in pressure. So the delta P uh, is just four times the velocity squared. And that works for the vast majority of the time. Um, so if the aortic valve velocity is four meters a second, four V squared is 64. So the peak gradient, the peak pressure gradient in millimeters mercury between the LVOT and the proximal aorta is 64 millimeters mercury. That's how we get it, uh, four V squared. So this is an example, again, I'm sort of focused on the aorta because it's, it's easy for examples. So LVOT, you get this sort of laminar flow that becomes turbulent as it goes across the, uh, the stenotic uh, valve. You have this concept of flow convergence. This is actually a vena contracta or a narrow orifice, which is the effective orifice area, which is a little bit smaller than the anatomic area. So one of the reasons you get a distinction or a difference between calf-derived measures sometimes, or, or rather, sorry, CT or MRI planimetry. Planimetry will give you the anatomic area. Echo Doppler, and to a large extent calf, will get you an effective area. They're not always the same. The effective area is usually a little bit smaller. It's never bigger, actually. It's either the same or smaller for an effective area. And that's because there is this concept of contraction of flow. So we're seeing this effect, not this effect. Um, in general, when you, this is a, a continuous wave Doppler across the aortic valve. Normal is about two meters. That's, that's how fast blood will go in a normally opening aortic valve. Four meters per second is a sort of a well-accepted cutoff for severe aortic stenosis. So anything about four meters per second in general means severe stenosis. There are some caveats. All of the determinations of flow are dependent on stroke volume. Uh, if somebody is uh, hyperdynamic with an EF of 80% or more, um, you have to do a little fudging. So these are the guidelines for what it all means, uh, for at least for aortic stenosis, and you can see uh, this is all Doppler derived. So gradients, as I mentioned, so over 40 millimeters mercury is severe AS, over four meters per second is also severe AS, and from that we derive a valve area. And we have 
I know other talks, and Dr. Barker's going to talk to you shortly about aortic stenosis and, and MR. Uh, that's going the wrong way. Okay. One of the concerns is the relationship, and the guidelines vary a little bit. This is uh, an interesting paper a few years ago, and it plotted really hundreds of patients, cath data, echo data. And if you look at the correlation between valve area and pressure, in fact, if you looked at 40 millimeters mercury as a sort of well-accepted cutoff for severe stenosis, the vast majority had a valve area of 0.8 centimeters squared, not 1.0. So 1.0 is out there. Most people in the echo world, and it's sort of a, uh, an ongoing debate of whether the valve area should be 1.0 or 0.8. But if you look at all a wealth of hemodynamic data, 0.8 correlates much better with 40 than 1 does, which is way up here. So um, that's to bring that to your attention. Now, a valve area of less than one is, is sensitive, but many would argue not specific enough for severe aortic stenosis. And you'll see it. We get referrals all the time for aortic valve replacement with a valve area of 1.0 or 0.99, and we often think that's more like moderate to severe. That may not be severe. Um, I won't go through all this. Just so you know, there are concepts that look at things like aortic stenosis, bringing in the Doppler concepts of f normal flow, low flow, high gradient, low gradient. There are these matrices that exist. Uh, perhaps Dr. Barker will just touch on this in the AS talk. But this is sort of uh, relevant to Doppler because we'd have to be considering the stroke volume, the gradient, and the flow in trying to determine uh, valve uh, severity by Doppler. Um, finally, uh, color Doppler I mentioned to you. Color Doppler is a, it's really just another way to display um, pulse wave Doppler. So it's, again, it's direction and velocity. It's not volume. Many people think that the color jet actually represents a volume of flow. It does not. Uh, it's just direction and velocity and not volume. And there's lots of ways that a jet can fool you uh, or the echo person um, by playing with the gains. Um, so just be aware of that, that what looks obvious isn't always obvious with color. It can be quite deceptive. So I wanted to show you quickly some of the basic ultrasound principles and demonstrate that we use ultrasound and Doppler to derive flow, stroke volume, regression volume, area, and pressure. I'll stop.